Good morning. My name is Ori Brofman. I just emerged from about a year and a half of writing. Um, yesterday I had a beard and uh, looked like I was just in a cave. Uh, it's really important for me to be here at DEF. Uh, Fridays are typically the days that I see my mother, my Jewish mother, who has a lot of interest in what I do. She's really interested. And there's good news associated with that because tomorrow she's going to want to know how this went. So if I disappoint you, I disappoint her. I will do my best. As you can tell from my accent, I, or maybe you can't, I was born in Israel and grew up in Texas. So shalom, y'all. <laughs> when I was nine, uh, we moved to Texas, and this is what we were expecting. <laughs> And this is what we got. Anybody recognize this place? El Paso, Texas. So when my brother and I uh, were landing, we actually thought we were crash landing. My dad was a student at UTEP. And after he finished, my entire family moved to the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I, I did my undergrad at UC Berkeley. In case any of you uh, heard, UC Berkeley is considered one of the more progressive universities. Is that kind of new? Yeah. Um, I was a peace and conflict studies major. So if you close your eyes for a second and imagine how my friends look like, you probably get this kind of image. And yet these days, a lot of my friends look like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. And the reason for that takes us back not to this Apache helicopter, but to the namesake from the Apaches. And we're going to go back in history. We're going to go to 1519 and meet this guy, Hernan Cortez who in 1519 went to um, modern-day Mexico City and encountered the Aztec uh, capital. And he marveled at the amount of complexity in the civilization that he saw. There were pyramids. There were roads. But he wasn't really there to do sightseeing, right? Uh, Cortez and his 80 men were there for one specific reason. And what was the reason? Why is it, as soon as I can turn this on, why is it that Cortez showed up in the New World? Was it gold? Yeah, he wanted gold. So he says, OK, show, take me to your commander. And they took him to Montezuma II. And he gives Montezuma II an ultimatum. He says, give me all your gold, or I'm going to kill you. Now you're Montezuma II. And I'm telling you, hey, give me all your gold. What do you say? No. Well, Unfortunately for Montezuma, he wasn't an American uh, fighter. So he said, OK, he capitulated. And he gave Cortez, um, he gives Cortez the uh, gold. But uh, Cortez is not a man of his word. He kills Montezuma. And he also blockades the outside of the Apache city. And within two weeks, 200,000 people die. And within two years, the entire Aztec civilization is wiped out. Now, there's a lot of reasons why the Spanish were so effective. First, they had a new technology, the horse. So there are 80 horses involved. Second, there was the introduction of biological warfare in the form of the diseases that the Spanish brought. Third, there was a lot of infighting. But you can't ignore the fact that a group of 80 soldiers with 80 horses is able to take down the Aztecs. And a few years later, the Spanish encountered the Inca. And they had the exact same gig going. Give us uh, your gold choice to your leader, um, or we'll kill him. They killed the leader. And by the end of the century, the Incas are conquered. And it's with the winds of victory in their backs that the Spanish encounter a new tribe, the Apache. And unlike the Spanish, um, the Apache didn't have any roads. They didn't have any pyramids. What's um, the other problem of trying to get the Apache? I'm going to just leave this thing on. What's the other problem of trying to get the Apache uh, gold or gold from the Apaches? They didn't have any gold. They didn't have any. Anybody been to El Paso, Texas recently? Not a lot of gold uh, around there, right? So say, well, the next best thing is you can adopt our agrarian lifestyle. 
And some of the Apaches went along with it, but some of them resisted. And here is the big difference between the Apache and the Aztecs that's going to be very relevant for us today. Instead of chiefs, they had folks called non-tons. Um, and the difference between an Anton and an Aztec chief is the Nantans didn't have the phrase, you should. It just didn't exist in their language. So if you want to follow an Anton, you can. And if you don't feel like following an Anton, you don't have to. When the Spanish started taking out Nantans, new ones took over. And we all of a sudden have fighters like Geronimo. And we already, all of a sudden have these Apache raiders. And here's the point of the story. The harder that the Spanish fought against the Apache, the stronger the Apache became. The harder they fought against them, the stronger the Apache became. This is the Apache territory when the Spanish first encountered them. And after 200 years of fighting first the Spanish, then the Mexicans, then eventually us, the Americans, this was the territory. It more than doubled. And in order to understand what's going on here, we turn to biology. When I was three years old, I had a friend named Danny Eschel. God knows what became of Danny Eschel, because his hobby was to take the legs off of ants. So maybe he's in a prison somewhere, right? But what happens if I take a spider and I take off the leg of a spider? What happens? You're going to have maybe a spider hobbling around. What happens when you take the head off a spider? It dies, right? What happens when you cut off the arm of a starfish? It grows a new arm back. Why? How is, the Spanish, uh, how is the starfish able to do this? Because unlike the spider, the starfish does not have a central head. Each one of the major organs are replicated across the arms. And scientists aren't exactly even sure how, spe uh, how starfish move. One arm goes this way and one arm goes the this way. And think about that as a metaphor for business and society. We're going to fast forward from the 16th century all the way up to 2001. And we're going to go to Boston. And there's this kid, and he liked to take a lot of naps. What was his name? Napster. So um, do you remember what Napster did? Download music. Yeah, exactly, right? Download music is a very nice way of talking about it, right? <laughs> he basically took music that was owned by the record labels and uploaded it to a server and shared it with his friends. Now, let's say that you're the head of, I don't know, a uh, Sony Music. What do you do? Sue them. Exactly, you sue them. That's the American thing to do, and it's an open and shut case. You sue them, and Napster goes out of business. But the moment that Napster goes out of business, there was a new company called Kazaa that unlike um, Napster, didn't have a centralized server. So there's still silly music. What do you do with Kazaa? It continued to regenerate. And you were the head of the music industry. What do you do? You try to contain and stop and cease and desist. If only they sue them as well, and they sue Kazaa out of business, which now eventually gives us Emule. Who are you going to fight? No one knows who created Emuel. The point of this is that the harder that you fight a starfish, the stronger it becomes. And we're going to fast forward even more in history to 2002 and to this guy. Anybody recognize who this guy is? Kim.com. Great. Tell us about Kim.com. He actually changed his name to Kim.com. He is, um, I think he's in prison now. Um, I think he did like dark web stuff or he, I don't know. There you go. Um, he did Mega Upload, which was exactly like Napster, but just for videos. And he lived in New Zealand, or he was in New Zealand. And you're right, he actually, not only was he sued, he was arrested and put behind bars. And this is a quote from him. A year ago, we were in a cell with only toilet paper and a blanket. How long did it take Mega Upload to go back online? A couple months. He went from this to this. And we're going to look at a third example. Anybody recognize what's going on here? Where? Drug sales. Don't tell my Jewish mother. Where, where are you? Uh, who, knew about, who, who knew about the uh, Silk Road? Silk Road. So tell us about the Silk Road. We see some pretty nefarious stuff up here. Yeah. It's, uh 
it's just on the dark web, so people you know think that they're doing anonymous transactions for you know illicit stuff. We're seeing some pills. We're seeing some green stuff. We're seeing a lot of stuff that we, uh, should not be sold. You can actually even buy a hit on someone uh, through uh, the Silk Road. Now, the Silk Road is run on the Tor uh, browser. Who introduced Tor? We did. We built it f for anonymous surfing. And it uses blockchain technology and Bitcoin based on starfish principles. But you have these people selling illicit things online. The government surely needs to do something. And they knew that it was run by some guy, but they weren't exactly sure who. And almost by accident, the uh, US Postal Service intercepted a package from Canada. And in it were eight passports. And they all had this, the picture of the same guy, but from a different identity and different names. And they're like, maybe we should find out who this is. So they go to the San Francisco, um, they go and they track him to San Francisco, and he turns out to be in the San Francisco library, and they arrest him right there at the San Francisco library, public library. And it's this guy. And he goes for, uh, on trial and actually gets life in prison for all the people who uh, died of overdoses because of the product. They also take the Silk Road down. How long does it take the Silk Road to go back online? Two hours. The harder that you fight a starfish, the stronger it becomes. Now, as soon as this guy gets arrested, there's a new guy from Dread Pirate, who was his nickname, to DEF CON. This guy. And of course, they arrest him as well, take down the, the Silk Road again, but it's going just deeper and deeper, becoming more and more and more distributed and more and more difficult to control. Now, we can sit here and we can look at, well, the heads of the music industry or the heads of the movie industry, or the heads of the DEA. And I would say they're all very smart people. The problem is that they're not understanding the basic DNA that makes starfish work. And we're going to look at two aspects of that DNA today. The first one are circles. And I'm going to tell you about something called the home church movement. I met this guy two months after I wrote the book named Neil Cole. And he told me about these home churches, which as the name suggests, rather than meeting inside of people's home, rather than meeting in churches, the home churches move, meet inside people's homes. And they have about 15 folks or so. And once to grow beyond the size of the living room, they split and they create another little church. And once you grow beyond that, they split and grow into another little church. And Neil said, hey, would you mind coming and speaking to us at a conference in San Diego? I said, sure. And it was a room kind of like this, just with, filled with pastors, and it had a couple hundred people. Now, if you had to guess, how many members do you think the home church has internationally? 200. 200, yeah, that's, that's a number up. What would you guess? Several million. 100. Several million, whoa, okay, this is like an eBay auction here. What do you guess? 5,000. 5,000. Few hundred thousand. That was my guess. My guess was 200,000. It was way off. The conservative number is 200 million. This is the biggest religious movement that none of us have heard about. And it's especially powerful in India and China. In China, you're not allowed to convene inside of uh, physical churches. The harder that you fight a starfish, the stronger it becomes. In order to understand this model of circles, we think about Bill W. And he was holding a can of beer in his hand, knowing fully well that if he kept, that if he kept on drinking, he would die. And he tried everything to try to combat his alcoholism. But nothing worked, until one of his friends visited the psychologist Carl Jung, who told him that he needed, he needed to have a spiritual transformation. And they held the first AA meeting. Um, which is uh, eight folks that just got together and helped each other. Until this day, AA is still the most effective way of combating alcoholism. Now think about this for a second. Let's say you're the AA of Austin and you're the AA of New York. And something horrible happens in New York. Austin, does it impede your ability to actually have meetings? 
And Bill W. had to make a decision. As the momentum grew for AA, all of a sudden there was Overeaters Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. Do you control the brand or do you actually allow it to grow? And it's amazing that these circles end up in very unexpected places. My book ended up in very unexpected places. It ended up in the hands of the Supreme Court. And Justice Thomas gave uh, the book to his wife, Jeannie Thomas. Now you can guess my politics. I live in San Francisco, I teach at UC Berkeley, um, and Jeannie gave a copy to this guy named Mark Meckler, who is in Sacramento, and Mark used the book in order to start the Tea Party. Now, you think about the Tea Party, and who's in charge of the Tea Party? Is it Sarah Palin? I wouldn't say she's in charge. Is it this guy, his name is Keith. He's the first blogger with the idea for the Tea Party. Is he in charge? This woman's name is Kelly. She's the first protester for the Tea Party. Is she in charge? Or does it even matter? Because in order to understand leadership in these kind of organizations, we actually have to look uh, towards Julie Andrews and back-to-back -back roles she played. So um, you look like you're a really big fan of musicals. Uh, yeah, Sound of Music's great. Great. Uh, 1964, 1965, uh, Julie Andrews played basically back-to-back -back roles. What happens at the end of um, The Sound of Music? Uh, she uh, gets married and they take off for uh, Vermont. Exactly. And what happens at the end of, San, of uh, Mary Poppins? Now that one I don't remember. She, anyone remember what happens? She leaves, she flies off. And when you think about it, right, these are back-to-back -back movies, 1964 and 1965. And when you really think about it, they're exactly the same movie. There's a dysfunctional family, there's a woman who comes and joins, they sing a lot of songs, and at the end, they get better. At the end of Sound of Music, though, she marries the dad. At the end of Mary Poppins, she gets out of the way. And think about that as a way of leading by getting out of the way. And we're going to look at modern-day non-tons. Remember, non-tons were those Apache chiefs. And who are modern-day Geronimos? Anybody recognize this guy? Craig. Um, this has an idea f uh, to create a list for um, events happening in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1995. Launches Craigslist from this house. 19 employees. His office was in um, the top basement. And you think about the impact that Craigslist has had on journalism and on newspapers. Anybody recognize this guy? Jimmy? He wanted to create an encyclopedia for people who didn't have enough money. And he doesn't have enough money to uh, hire editors. So he basically hires a lot of volunteers and creates Wikipedia, right? Anybody here brought, bought an encyclopedia in the last, like, one year? Five years? Ten years? Encyclopedia Britannica is going out of, out of existence. I remember when I was in elementary school, I would, I would borrow an encyclopedia and write a report based on which encyclopedia was actually available, right? Now I'm going to show you a video, and I promise you it's going to be a very boring video, but a very important one. All right, so here we are, one of the uh, elephants. And the cool thing about these guys is that, is that they have really, really, really long um, fronts, and that's, that's cool. And that's pretty much all there is to say. So we learned a lot about elephants here. Why is this video so important? First YouTube video. Now, I was at a company, I shouldn't say their name, but it ends with Corsoft in 2006. And I was like, you guys should really start paying attention to this. And they were like, eh, you know, it's just a bunch of cat videos. YouTube. Uh, was purchased by Google for about a billion dollars. And you look at its value today. We don't see the power of these things until it's oftentimes too late. And this brings us to this guy. So remember, I went to UC Berkeley, a uh, peace studies major, and I'd never had a conversation with anyone in uniform. And I get a, a call from this guy named Martin Dempsey. 
And uh, my first question, he told me he was a four-star general in the Army. My first question was, is there a five-star? Um, I didn't know what to call him, so I called him Marty. And he invited me over to Virginia, where he was based at the time. At the time, he was in charge of leadership at the Army. And he told me about how the Army is trying to figure out how to adopt more network-like approaches in order to respond to terror threats. And he said, what do you think you sh we should do? And I'm sitting across from him, and my first reaction was, I don't know. And honestly, I'm not a consultant. I'm not a contractor. I think there's way too many people in, from the outside trying to tell the Department of Defense what to do with your one magic bullet. And I said to him, you don't know either because of the stars on your uniform. And I was kind of about to like, wrap it up and say, like, well, good luck with this entire terror network thing. And I noticed that across from us, um, there was a box on his, on his table. And I said, Marty, what's inside the box? And he opens the box. And there are these cards inside. And they're the size of baseball cards. And instead of pictures of athletes, there are pictures of uh, soldiers who served underneath him and soldiers who died in combat. And he lays the cards on the table. And you can feel the weight on his shoulders. And, you could, and he tells, tells me how he carries the cards around with him and how he calls the families. And he closes the box, and the inscription is, make it matter. So as an experiment about seven years ago, we started having uh, multiple programs, first in the Army and then across the forces, to create these starfish networks. And we happen to have a couple of people who uh, went to the inaugural uh, program. Hi, Brett. How are you doing? Good. How was the, I, I didn't tell you I was going to talk to you, but how was the experience in, uh, in the suffrage program? I, and I think um, it's much different than anything that I'd experienced before, because the Army is very, as you could say, hierarchical. Are you, that word. Hierarchical. Right. I can't say it either. Hierarchical. So the ability to communicate, I guess, laterally between, uh, plus talking about emotions and other things, which much different than what... Uh, we were used to in the army, I would say. Hi, Heather. How would you, say, how, how would you describe the program? Because I've been trying to describe it for about seven years and not having a lot of luck. Yeah, it was surprising. It was very different than anything I'd experienced, um, at least on Uncle Sam's dime for leadership. So, yeah. Um, so the idea was to create a network within the quote unquote uh, spider. Now, please do not leave this presentation thinking that spiders are bad, starfish are good. Rather, there's times that I want to be more starfish and there are times that I want to be more spider. And what gets really interesting is the combo special. And specifically, how can we create starfish within spiders? And this brings us back to Neil Cole. Remember the home church movement guy. And I was with him a few months ago down in Dallas. Now look where he's sitting. It's inside a 10,000 person megachurch. Megachurches are realizing that in order to stay relevant, they need to foster the home church mentality. And whether you're coming from a defense background or from a corporate background, the question is how can you create these starfish networks towards becoming more agile, towards becoming more effective? And you think about looking at the future and thinking about starfish as a way of harnessing power. So as a country, what are the threats that we're going to be facing? Is it going to be this guy? It's like the horseman of the, the apocalypse. Well, we took care of him. But who's upcoming? Is it this guy? Or is it this guy? Or is it both? And the answer is we don't know. So the military has said, well, we need to be agile. Therefore, we need to have agile leaders, right? Now. What's an agile leader? Has anybody ever heard of someone who is really rigid and they go to like a five like hour program and they come out being flexible? Two day program and they come out flexible? Five day program and they come out flexible? Anybody heard of this? I don't think you can really teach someone to be agile, but I do think you can create an agile network around you. And here's what I mean, and this brings us back to the networks, and we're gonna use terrorism as, as an example for just a sec. Imagine you're doing a, um, you're trying to blow up a bridge in Iraq. 
You're probably going to get someone who knows a lot about ammunitions, maybe someone who knows about cell phones. And you're going to activate them depending on the context of the situation. Now, the nodes of the network need not be agile. The nodes don't have to be agile. It's a connection between them that's distributed. Similarly, if you're launching a cyber attack, you might get someone who knows a lot about hacking and maybe someone who knows about security. They're going to be different individuals, different nodes. And you're going to activate them depending on the context of, this, of the situation. Similarly, in your organization, how can you create a network where you can activate different nodes depending on the context of the problem? And we're going to look at um, four specific ways that you can take with you in order to leverage Starfish within your organization. The first is the idea of finding knowledge from the edge of the network. And we're going to go to the field of medicine for a second and see how trash cans are saving lives. Anybody recognize what's going on here? This is staph infection, uh, antibiotic resistant staph infection. You have more, uh, more people die of staph infection than of HIV every year. Think about that. More people die of staph infection than of HIV every year in the United States. And your best way of getting staph infection is to go to the hospital. And there's a really easy, easy cure to prevent staph infection. You know what you do? You wash your hands. So hospitals are realizing, hey, people are dying because of this. So they started campaigns to get doctors to wash hands. And they put up nice signs. Anybody think that the signs worked? So they put up bigger signs. They were more artistic. They were more colorful. Anybody thinks that those worked? No. Nope. So they sent doctors to two-day trainings about hygiene. Anybody thinks that that worked? That's because information does not change behavior. I'll repeat it. Information does not change behavior. If it did, all of us would floss. None of us would smoke. So instead of just dumping information down to people, the head of infection control assembled everyone from the hospital, including this guy. Uh, this guy's name is Jasper. He was a Vietnam veteran, didn't finish high school. And his job was to just clean rooms um, after patients were in them. And he noticed that in the wings where there was a lot of staph infection, the garbage cans were empty. The staff wasn't using gloves. And they were like, this is weird. Uh, why aren't they using gloves? Don't they know that you need to use gloves? So rather than talking about them, the entire team went to that wing and said, what's up? Why aren't you using gloves? And that specific unit said, well, you know, nurses here, we have extra small hands. And this hospital is so cheap that they won't get us enough extra small gloves. And we said, well, what if we give you more extra small gloves? And they said, well, of course we'd use it. So the janitor takes out his pen, draw, uh, puts his number on the wall, and says, anytime you run out of gloves, call me. And it's small, little, incremental changes like that that reduce the number of infections by 70%. And it's not that the entire hospital needed to have more extra small gloves. No, was it that the janitor should have been in charge of infection control. Rather, depending on the context of the situation, you get different nodes activated to solve the problem. This is how Silly String is saving lives across, uh, across the sea. And I couldn't get an actual picture of someone clearing a room, um, but I've met someone who was the person opening the door who uh, ended up being booby-trapped and lost a, an arm and a leg. I met a guy who lost his uh, best friend and partner in a situation like this. And all of a sudden, a very junior enlisted soldier comes up with this idea, if we spray silly string inside of the room, we'll be able to tell whether it's booby-trapped or not. It's a $2 solution that's saving lives overseas. And I want to see if we can have the same kind of innovation here in the room today. So um, I have cards here somewhere. Where are my cards? They're right below me. See? The answer is always in the room, that's the assumption. And what I'd like you to do is, here's some cards, help me pass along some cards, more cards for you. 
I wanted to, to um, I'm going to give you a very high tech uh, note card. You'll notice that the note card has two sides. I want you to just look on the written side, I'm sorry, on the line side. And I want you to put one idea down, exactly one idea down. If you have five ideas, that's great. If you have 10 ideas, that's great. Put one. If you have zero ideas, put one idea down to answer this question. How do we, the people in this room, you can't say they, how do we, the people in this room, bridge the mill save divide and foster cross-sector entrepreneurship? On this, I want you to write very legibly, and I do not want you to put your name on there. So write legibly, don't put your name. How many ideas? And only one. Okay, I'll give you a few minutes. If you're done, stand up with your note card and your pen. Stand up, everyone stand up. All right, now we get to walk around a little bit. What I want you to do is turn the cards over to the blank side and swap cards with one another. Just keep on swapping, swap cards. Swap cards, walk around. I wanna make sure that these, the cards get around the room. So keep on swapping cards, swap cards, swap cards, swap the cards, swap the cards, swap the cards. Keep on swapping cards, keep on swapping cards, keep swapping cards, keep swapping cards. This is fun and interesting. Okay, and stop. Okay, I wanna make sure, keep on standing up, we're gonna do this uh, for a little bit. Um, I wanna make sure that there's a card, everyone has a card? Anybody doesn't have a card? That wrote a card? Awesome. On the, I want you to read the idea to yourself, and then on the back of the card, you're gonna rate the idea on a scale of one to five. This is really important. Five is great, one is bad. Five is really good, one is thank you for your interest in national defense. Three is like meh. Use whole numbers and put one idea on the back. Now does everyone have exactly one number on the back of their cards? You'd be surprised, I've been in a room full of generals who are like, I have two numbers. It's like, where did that come from? <laughs> one number, right? Now we're gonna do this a few more times. So we're gonna turn over the cards to the writing, so turn it over to the written part. And when we, when we give them to each other, we make sure to read the idea first so, and don't look at the number on the back because we don't want to get uh, biased by the previous idiot who, who wrote a number, okay? So swap cards again, swap cards again, make sure you have a new card. Swap cards, swap cards, swap cards, swap cards. Make sure it's a new idea and stop. Okay, and remember, don't look at the number. Come up with a, with a number in your head, and then commit to it, and then put it in the back of the card. We're doing the exact same thing, but just don't look at, wh at whoever read it before, because we don't want to get biased by their opinion, right? OK. At the end of this, how many numbers should we have at the back of the cards? OK, we're going to do this three more times. Swap cards, swap cards, swap cards, swap cards, swap cards. Again, remember, face up so you don't look at the number. You don't look at the number. And stop. Make sure it's a card that you haven't seen before. And rate it again on a scale of one to five. If you've seen something before, make sure to just uh, trade it with a friend. Okay, at the end of this, how many numbers do we have? Does anybody not have three numbers in the cards? You guys are awesome. Swap cards again, swap cards again, swap cards again. And stop, make sure it's a card that you have not seen. And how many numbers do we have now? Perfect, one last time, swap cards, swap cards. And stop, and stop, make sure it's a card that you have not seen. All right. 
And at the end of this, we should have five numbers at the, at the cards, right? Not time to sit yet. We're going to stand around the perimeter of this room. So just kind of stand around in a U shape along the wall. Does everyone stand along the wall? And as you do that, I want you to look at the five numbers on the back of your card and add them up. This should be pretty easy. If you need help, you can uh, use a calculator. <laughs> and you should have a number in the back of your card between one, um, 5 and 25, right? Circle that number or put a square in it or put a triangle, whatever you want. And I'm going to do a reverse auction. I'm going to find out whether there's any 25s, etc. And if I do that, I'm going to go to you and you're going to read the card. Now, if your idea gets called, you can celebrate, but celebrate quietly, just to yourself. <laughs> For this to actually work, we're not going to share whose idea was whose. If you're really, really happy, you can get in touch with my mom, and she'll be very proud of you. But this needs to remain confidential or anonymous. So with that being said, are there, I'm going to get my exercise in a sec. Are there any 25s? Tough crowd. 24th. Hi, what's your name? Yes. Hi, I'm Jen. Hi, Jen. Um, is this on? I, I don't know. No, it's not. Reflect for a second about how good of an idea that was. Okay. Okay, Jen. What so, was the idea? The idea is to create tours of duty for private sector managers to serve in .gov.mil services. Great idea. Read it one more time a little bit slowly. Create tours of duty for private sector managers to serve in .gov or .mil services. Wonderful idea. Thank you. Any other 24s? 23s. 22s. OK, we're, we're, okay. Uh, this, this will give me my tour duty. Get it? Tour duty? Uh, OK. <laughs> take a soldier to work day and take a corporate worker to war for a day. Interesting. Read it again. Just, it's a really good idea. Take a soldier to work day and take a corporate worker to war for a day. Wonderful idea. Hi. All right, this is a little long. By creating better military to academic networks, and then a bunch of sub-bullets, we send military members to advanced degree programs in civilian universities. Uh, military members earn a degree, MA, PhD. And last one, we fail to enable or give opportunities for the military member to maintain, grow, leverage the academic network they grow during the school. Whoever said that, thank you. You'll find out in a bit, but that's a really good idea. Any other 23s? Are you the uh, first one? 23. 22. Sorry, I forgot. 22s. Uh, this is my PT for the day. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, deeper cross utilization programs, fellowships that bring military into industry and industry in the military to expose, inform, involve, and tackle emergent issues. I see a really good theme. Thank you. Another 22. These are really good ideas. Okay. Yeah, mine's along the same vein. Implement cross-discipline program for professional training and education. Business leaders embed with military, and military leaders embed with business. All right, metaphorically. And other 22s. Awesome. Anybody have a 21 that has not that is not, that is of a different theme? That's very different than what we heard. Okay. Or is PT is happening now? Okay. Have dinner with them. Oh, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, if you can pass the cards, just uh, put them on this table, and we'll give them to the deaf folks, um, and then have a seat. Cool. How is that like for folks? How so? What's the problem with brainstorming? What are some problems with brainstorming? Brainstorming is awesome, but what's the problem with brainstorming? Everyone converges on the same thing. What's another problem with brainstorming? Yeah. You can't tell. Like, what's the first thing we did here? We let you think for a second. Uh, three minutes. What's another problem with brainstorming? It takes a lot of time, an hour that I don't have every day to come up with new ideas. What's another problem with brainstorming? Uneven contribution. If I'm sitting there, no one ever gets fired for not innovating. Why would I start, try to risk myself? What's another problem with brainstorming? Introverts. Any introverts in this room? Of course, you're not going to raise your hand, you're introverts. As you might have, 
as you might have guessed, I'm an extrovert, but extroverts, we like talking and doesn't give introverts enough of a chance to pop in. There's a really interesting uh, study that shows that the amount of effort it takes to participate for the first time in a group is much, much higher than the amount of effort it takes to participate a second time or a third time. What's another problem with brainstorming? Bias. You are the problem with brainstorming. If you're in there and you're running a department or a unit, they're going to tell you what you, they think that you want to hear. What's another problem with brainstorming? You make yourself vulnerable. And we put all these ideas on, on the wall. And we pretend that all ideas are created equal. They're not. I hate to break this to you, but some of you got some fives in there. Some of your ideas sucked. We don't know whose ideas sucked. And the idea is that if you're running this in a unit, what you can do is you take all the ideas, you rank the top five or top six, and you split into smaller groups to seeing, OK, how can we get a concrete next step along this line of effort? And at the end, you also have all these cards that are ranked. And you can find out, according to the room, what was useful and what wasn't. Now, there's a chance that there was a really good idea that got a six or a seven. And you have that ability to actually discern what it was. This brings us to this idea of innovation and how do we innovate within very top-down organizations. And we're going to look at civilizations for a second and what to leave behind. The Egyptians left the pyramids, the Greeks, the Romans, the Chinese left a big wall. Right, the question is how do you do this within large organizations and that don't necessarily embrace change? And the idea here is I think it's a little difficult to look at companies that innovate for a living and say, let's apply this in an organization where a mistake means life and death. And we need to have that different mindset that if you're going to, um, if lives are on, on the matter, on the line, then you're going to make sure that you're going to innovate in a way that doesn't actually kill people, right? So if you're acquiring a tank, and I can tell you, Model X um, has this kind of armor. But Model X plus Y has a little bit more armor that might save an American soldier's life. Of course, you're going to go with that model. So we need to actually put ourselves in, in, um, in the place where, look, you're going to have lives at stake. And you can innovate in a very marginal, small way in ways that are actually important for the mission of, of the organization. You can't have too much variance in an organization. Um, and afford to be able to move on. With that, we have a video back. Thank you so much. So how do you use this in order to innovate? So um, your, your, uh, your question was spot on. And we look at civilizations and what civilizations have left behind. The Egyptians, now you understand. The Romans, <laughs> the Greeks, the Chinese. And yet, one of the most effective conquerors of all time, Genghis Khan, didn't leave anything behind. The Mongols were incredibly effective. They assigned eight little ponies for each uh, rider. They had uh, these flat stirrups that you can actually stand on as you rode. And they had a compound bow. They had arrows with holes in them. Anybody know why they had ar arrows with holes? Yep. And you can also hear them as they were coming. Now, they were vicious. This is what it looks like. And there's stories of them actually walling out an entire village and killing everyone inside the village, except for a couple of people who would go on and tell how horrible the Mongols were and how much to fear them. This was the Mongol territory in 1206. And at the end of the century, this is their territory. If everyone tells you that you can't win a land war in Asia, tell them about the Mongols. What they did leave behind are bridges, more bridges than any society has left in history. If you've ever had tea with a Russian, it's because the Mongols brought tea from China to Russia. If you've ever, if you've ever had lemon chicken, it's because the Mongols brought lemons from Persia to China. If you've ever seen this guy, James Bond, using cards, it's because he used cards as a way of trading across the kingdom. If you've ever used these numbers, Arab numbers, it's because the Mongols brought them from the Arab world to the rest of Asia. Anybody try to do long division using Roman numerals? 
right? Kind of hard. And the reason they were so effective was um, the Silk Road. Not the Silk Road with the bad stuff on it, but the first Silk Road. Within a day's journey, they would have these protected places that actually communicated with one another using smoke signals. And it's at these places where you had someone from one part of the empire talking to another part of the empire and trading and collaborating and changing information. And yet we have this myth of Archimedes and this myth of the lone genius getting to the hat tub and understanding, hey, this is a eureka moment. And unfortunately, innovation does not work this way. We put up pictures of people like Steve Jobs and we say, hey, here's a lone genius, but let's listen to Steve Jobs describe his experience trying uh, when he went to Xerox Park in 1976 and looked at what Xerox Park was doing. And they showed me really uh, three things. But I was so blinded by the first one that I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a network computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this someday. And this gives Steve Jobs the first operating system that was lifted from um, Xerox Park. Now, Steve Jobs would never steal an idea, would he? Let's listen to him talk about his experience. I mean, Picasso had a saying, he said, good artists copy, great artists steal. And we have, you know, always been shameless about stealing great ideas. And this brings us to, anybody recognize if, um, Anybody knows what I'm talking about when I'm talking about some blue, small blue pills? Anybody care to admit that they know what I'm talking about? What was the origin of the small blue pills? It was a heart, it was a heart medication. It was a heart medication, and there was a study around, hey, would uh, this actually reduce um, um, blood pressure in folks? And there was a human study. It didn't work. So instead, um, the, the doctors were going to call off the study. And the participants in the study, oftentimes their spouses were like, uh-uh, uh, doctor, I'm having fun for the first time ever. And it's through listening to the edge of the network that Pfizer was able to develop um, Viagra and billions of dollars involved in that. Now, I'm going to show you a film of people doing the Lindy Hop, and I want you to pay special attention to their feet. We're going to fast forward two years later, and this is the BBC Studios. Take a look at the film. Anybody recognize who this is? Not, not Frank Sinatra? Not Fred Astaire? Muhammad Ali. Ali just danced like Fred Astaire that night, just like he was on a jitterbug contest. And Ali had the lightness and the swiftness and the quickness of feet connected with his body, his hands, his arms, his head, all together. He never danced like that again. And that was just something to behold. He had a ball that night. Uh, he was a happy character. Because the ring was his domain, his kingdom. And when that bell would ring, he would really take over. Muhammad Ali took the Lindy Hop and applied it in a different context, applied it inside of the boxing ring. But there's surely some kind of new innovation, right? So we're going to go to 1982, the Apollo Theater. 
clear into this, right? Right, kind of cool, something, right? 1956. Which is to say, oftentimes it's about rediscovering and reapplying an innovation from one unit to the other. Which brings us to this guy. Anybody speak Russian? You all will soon. Um, his name is Pyotr Ufimtsev. He was a Russian mathematician who had this really abstract concept about how geographic planes would deflect radiomagnetic energy. And the Russians were so interested in what he had to say that they let him actually publish uh, internationally, which is they didn't care at all. Because at the time, this was the height of the Cold War. And these American scientists happened upon uh, Pyotr's uh, research. And they run an experiment. And they put an object under radar. And lo and behold, it disappeared, which gives, gives us a stealth fighter. The Russians had everything they needed in order to build it. They just couldn't see what was underneath their noses. Think about that. What ideas exist in your organization that you just can't see? And how do you draw that knowledge from the edge? Anybody recognize what's going on here? I show this to my undergrads. They're like, what is this? So there's a lens. There's some transistors. That's a cassette tape. This is the world's first digital camera, 1974. Do you know who it was invented by? Kodak. Kodak just files for bankruptcy, right? They were afraid of um, taking their film business and taking away from their film business. The third idea here, and the third takeaway, is that you need to recognize that the new generation is operationalizing play. What looks like little games that Pyotr is doing on that digital camera is actually really serious. And I want to talk to you for a second about um, Occupy Wall Street. It's easy to dismiss what they were doing. And it's easy to think of this next generation as just self-absorbed in their telephones. But I think in order to, under it, it, trying to understand what's going on in today's world without looking at Occupy is like trying to understand rock and roll without understanding Woodstock. Now, what was so efficient about Occupy is that they were able to uh, leverage a couple of things. And they were able to leverage things that looked like toys before. So anybody recognize what's going on here? Exactly. So this is a toy from the year 100. There's a fire. There's a cauldron full of water. The water heats up and creates steam, and it rolls around and around and around and around. No one really cared about this until 2,000 years later, which gives us the steam engine. This is a video from the University of North Carolina from a couple of years ago. During finals, students were trying to let off some steam. All right, fun, no harm, this is the flash mob. Now, when the Occupy protesters started uh, going to New York, they weren't allowed to have amplified sound. So they used something called the human microphone, which is, I would say something, and then everyone else in the front row repeats, and then everyone else repeats it, and then all of a sudden you have uh, an amplified sound, essentially, from the people right there. And in order to organize, they use these flash mobs in order to tell people where to go. This is what it looks like. And then they have a deaf clap, so everyone do this with me. Deaf clap. Come on. Yay. OK. I didn't see it, everyone. OK, deaf clap, everyone. Yay, OK. Um, so let's see what he's saying. We're all part of this movement. We amplify each other's voices so we can hear one another. There is no hierarchy. And rather than concentrating at what he's saying, can we concentrate at how he's saying it? Anybody find something interesting? 
He's speaking in tweets. And you say, well, nothing ever happened from Occupy, right? So let's fast forward a couple of years to Walmart. And all of a sudden, Walmart was starting to have some issues with their employees and whether they were paying them enough. Now, see if there's anything familiar in this protest against Walmart. They're operationalizing play. And the last, and I think most important takeaway here, is how do you foster inclusion? I don't think you can have innovation without having real inclusion. And there's two elements to inclusion. The first is around trust. And I want to talk for a moment about the nature of human activity. We have fight or flight. And when you have a fight or flight response, your body produces cortisol. And cortisol is the hormone that you have that if you hear a really loud um, noise in the middle of the night, it wakes you up and it makes you ready to fight. We would not be in this room were it not for cortisol, right? But after a while, cortisol actually is really taxing to the system. But you see cortisol release everywhere you look in nature. If they could, they would kind of do this kind of thing, right? Fight and flight, there's 60 years of research to confirm that fight or flight are the responses to a stressful situation. And a few years ago, two UCLA researchers, two women, found out that there was a huge problem with all of the research for 60 years. And the problem was that it was focused on one group of people, on men. And they recognized that there are times that when they have a stressful situation, they also tend and befriend. And think about tending and befriending as a way of fostering trust, of fostering innovation. And when you tend to befriend, your body produces oxytocin. There's a lot being written about oxytocin. A lot of it is kind of mumbo-jumbo. What we do know about oxytocin is that it's a chemical that is released when a mother delivers her baby. And she looks at her baby and falls in love instantly. And it's the hormone that's released that makes you all forget about how horrible childbirth was, and you'll do it again. And the question is, how do we foster a little bit of oxytocin? Which brings us back to UC Berkeley. I teach there, and I recognize that in order to bridge the divide, we need to have some levels of conversations, some way of having people like this meet people like this. And I brought a couple of folks who I met through the Starfish program and brought him to Berkeley to lecture. And this is a guy named Chip who was in front of a room of 500 people. And rather than talking about politics, and these are all Berkeley students, he talked about experiences from overseas. And I was sitting next to a woman in a hippie dress and I saw her actually crying because she never recognized what you all have actually gone through. How can we share these human stories? Afterwards, um, the class actually sat down with, with a couple of those folks on the grass, just talking about their experiences. And the Berkeley program was so powerful that we started implementing it. Um, with National Defense University, we now bring 30 people from the Army for two weeks uh, on a broadening program where they get to really be a part of this community. And the idea here is not just to have inclusion, it's to have radical inclusion. The title of our book is Radical Inclusion, what the post 9-11 world should have taught us about leadership. And I'm writing it with Marty Dempsey. The idea being that inclusion is no longer nice to have, it's a strategic imperative. And with these army groups, we actually got them embedded in the community. So there are these, all these arts fairs happening in San Francisco all the time. We said, why don't we volunteer for you? Why don't we help you build some of this art? And here you have a bunch of enlisted and officers erecting an art piece, and the, and the artist who's sitting there in the left is like, who are you? And they're like, we're army. And they're like, really? And this just interaction spurned enough excitement that the Berkeley City Council, I guess, again, not typically who you'd think would embrace the military, created a proclamation, a unanimous proclamation, that June is um, June 5th was bridging the mill Civ Divide Day. And if Berkeley and the military can just come together for a moment and say, what actually unites us? Imagine what we can do as a country. The idea here is that we can change the context 
of the situation. Now, let me show you a group of fish. What would you say about the fish on the right? What would people say? Hungrier, faster, smarter, he's the leader. And if I show this uh, cartoon indeed to a bunch of high school kids from America, that's the interpretation they'll give me. If I show the exact same cartoon to kids in China, what will they say? He's weak and he smells, he's ostracized. And if you show it to folks in Hong Kong, half time they'll give you the American interpretation, half time they'll give you the Chinese interpretation, and you can cue which interpretation they'll give you, depending on whether you show them a picture of McDonald's or a traditional Chinese uh, symbol. It's all about changing the context. I want to leave you with looking at two videos. This first one is from the Swiss Alps, and it's a bunch of folks who go all the way up on top of the mountain, and then they ski down, but they're attached to parachutes, and this is what it looks like. Okay, so how does this feel? Crazy, intense, exhilarating. I showed this to a group of special ops folks. They're like, yeah, sign me up. And then a couple weeks later, I was at an insurance company. They're like, oh my god, the bills. <laughs> now, we're going to look at the exact same video. But instead of the original music, there's a different soundtrack underneath. And see if it changes the mood at all. All of a sudden, you can see some of the beauty. It's a little softer. The content didn't change at all. The context changed. And wherever you are in an organization, you can change the context. You can change the way that we're speaking about things. Not for everything, not always, but have those tools. Maybe now you see the beauty in what they're doing. It's so dangerous, but you see the artistry of it. And how can we change the tone of the conversation within an organization and with the way that the civilian world is talking to the military world? And this brings me back to my mother. She's going to call me in a couple hours, and she's going to want to know how, how it went. And I will tell you that I'm the last person who I ever thought would be in front of a defense group. But what you're doing matters. And I'm passionate about it. And recognizing that we can build these bridges, that we can create these networks to become more agile, that we can actually empower the edge, matters to me. This is my personal email. Please get in touch, and I will be here for the next couple of days. But thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to continuing the conversations. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm taking questions. No, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm hanging. Yeah. Um, please. 
uh, join me again in a round of applause. The previous one just did not do justice. Um, for a person to kick off uh, this weekend with the, the ideas, the style, the, uh, the professionalism of, of this, and his uh, incredible patience with uh, technical issues, um, personally, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for supporting us. Thank you for being a non-ton in your own and being part of this total you know, decentralized movement to help improve the way national security is. Awesome, um, thank you. Thank you.